Scott Payne is on showing you. You're all very welcome to this, the 45th annual conference of SETI. We are here on the weekend and we didn't think we were going to be here, so thank you all for making whatever change you had to do to your arrangements to be here despite Mother Nature's best attempts to uh, foil us. Before we start, can I just as a matter of safety point out the emergency exits for all of us at the back and here at the front should the need arise, but obviously it's not going to because there's too much energy here today that's all positive. Um, with that further ado, I would just like to invite Anne Mooney, who many of you will know. She's the Executive Dean of the Institute of Education here in DCU. She spoke to us last year and sent us all off with definitely fire in our belly after our meeting. So without further ado, I'm going to invite Anne to open our conference. Changes isn't able to be here uh, with you. Actually, it is interesting. He's in um, he's in San Francisco because last night the Ireland Funds presented a distinguished leadership award to DCU alumna Lorraine Tuol, and Lorraine is the global is a senior is a senior VP at Google. She's one of the most senior women leaders in that company. And in her speech last night, she spoke about the importance of universities connecting students to the real world. And of course, as the president of DCU was there, she made the point that in her experience, DCU has done that. I think the role of the relationship between universities and the real world used to be quite clear. Universities were in one place and the real world was somewhere else. Uh, often expressed in the ivory tower imagery um, and, uh, and, and, and usually with a certain amount of um, pride on both sides that neither the Venn, the, the, that in the Venn diagram of the university in real life that neither actually intersected. Gone are the days. The new technological universities are about to come on screen for legislation. DCU has always positioned itself uh, within real life, um, very much coming out of the community on the north side of Dublin and connected first as the National Institute for Higher Education. And now as a global, uh, a global university, but with that real strong connection to industry, to society, to communities, and, uh, and to its graduates, and to its graduates and students. We want to congratulate um, Ceci on celebrating its 45 years. You are older than Dublin City University. Um, and, uh, and that says something, uh, why DCU is a young university. Ceci has been around a long time. I'm looking forward to Elizabeth's address, in particular Elizabeth and Richard's address, when they reflect on the intersection between Ceci and real life. Because I'm guessing that when Ceci first gathered itself as a group of people interested in commuter, commu computers and education, it too was seen as esoteric of itself, a group of people very passionate about a minority sport, really, and real life was somewhere else, particularly within the education system. And I don't doubt that in the course of Elizabeth and Richard's address, it will evoke the imagery of the early days of computers in education. I was a student in, in those times, and a student in school, and the, uh, the trolley, this vast thing that moved around the school that had something to do with computers. It took two people to push it around. It had its own rooms. Um, and, uh, and it would be that the, car the pieces of cardboard, the paper, where we looked at the bits of, of computers and how they all connected together. COBOL, uh, BASIC. Uh, all these words that became part of our vocabulary as a school student, uh, as a school student, and then looking at how things have changed, uh, uh, things have changed in the community and education. But Ceci and DCU have more in common than their age and, and relationship to real life. I think that when Ceci talks about the promotion of IT and education in a manner that's consistent with the best principles and standards in education, you, 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 your Venn diagram is of computing and education connected. 
from the get-go. And while there's great excitement now at finally getting to a situation, getting to the context where we've got computers, computing as a subject in, in the legal certificate examination, and that excites me, and it was as, uh, as somebody who was involved in the NCCA when, that, when we started pushing that, uh, that ball up the hill, uh, it's fantastic to see it finally come to fruition. For me, I think, and probably for most educators, what excites us is not just the potential for thinking about computing that, that, that having a legal certificate subject in this area will bring, but just the potential to be a tipping point in education, and particularly the, the, the groundbreaking position um, that the this, this subject will be assessed in using a computer. In other countries, I suppose, if you said to people, we're going to develop a, a computing subject in legal certificate and there will be a paper-based examination, they would find that ridiculous. But when the debate started off three or four years ago, it was entirely that was a scenario. Because we couldn't envisage any other way of doing the assessment. We couldn't really think about it. Because our, our, our default setting when we think about examinations is a room like this, and papers and pencils, and extra extra paper if you need it. Um, the groundbreaking work done by education colleagues in uh, the materials technology subjects, uh, the T4 subjects, the design and communication graphics are the champions here. Uh, they, they first broke through uh, in students presenting, pro pro um, presenting their AutoCAD projects uh, using computing. But I was involved in debates where people said, yeah, but could, they, could we print those out? Could we look at a picture? Because the complexities around using the technology at that time were so great. Having our new, um, our new subject in leaving certificates, the new computer science subject, having the exam using a computer will, I think, be a tipping point because the students involved will begin to say, what about maths? What about geography? What about art? What about digital? They will begin, it is the students who will begin to say, who will, and that small group of 40 schools, I think, will become trailblazers in, in, lots, of other, in lots of other ways. I want to say, too, that, that DCU's work um, connects up with, with, um, with sectors in very practical ways. We've always had um, staff here associated with SESI and Enza, and Miriam, I know, are very much involved in the organization. I know that others here, like Monica, have been in, or DCU have been involved in the development group for computer science. And also, I want to acknowledge the contribution of SETI to that development group. I'm going to guess, because I was chief executive of NCCA for 15 years, I think it was the quickest one ever developed. Uh, I think it was very speedy, which probably shows a number of things. One, the political support for the subject. Can't beat a, a bit of political support to get things done. Two, the long history. On the one hand, people are saying, well, that computer science uh, specification, that has really, you know, that's been really quick. It actually hasn't. <laughs> As Elizabeth will talk about, it's taken a really, really long time. But I'm guessing you, we reached a tipping point of so many people saying, why not? Of so many people saying, it's time. And of some of the big questions that are presenting themselves that I mentioned last year around the relationships between computing and now artificial intelligence and society requiring a literate population, an engaged population who can understand, um, shape and critique the technology. I think all of those things came together to, to, deliver, to deliver the subject. And I think that is a, that's a major, a major breakthrough. So I'm thrilled to be here on the day when SESI meets, when you can be sure that there will be a group of students coming into classrooms in September with the subject computer science on their timetable, not in their lunchtime, in their after school, for the, for the, the hobby club, but actually made as a subject. And a cohort of teachers, very passionate teachers, recon, uh, recognised for that. My final word, I think, is just about the subject and the, and the challenge and the teaching force. You couldn't help but be struck at the photographs that came from the very enthusiastic launch about the gender balance in the number of teachers who were at the launch and the, 
the low number of the proportion of men to women. Now, you could remark that if you were launching something in home economics, the, the, uh, the gender differences would also be notable. You could argue that if you were launching something in the technologies, the gender differences would be, would be notable. But this is a new subject with a long history and we have to be really careful that we don't allow the patterns that other subject areas fell into very quickly, that we don't allow that to happen in computer science and even search. And that does, and it's great to see that in the 40 schools there's been a really conscious effort to ensure that there's a good gender mix in the, in the students taking the subjects, but we have a particular responsibility, I think, around the teaching force. It's part of the bigger challenge of girls and women in STEM, but I think as we start this new subject, there's great potential there, and where I'm standing and looking out at this audience here, clearly SESI are, have the balance needed to ensure that when the teaching force um, for leaving search computer science becomes established, that it does have, it does have, that, uh, it does have that balance. DCU has a particular passion for gender equality. We've just had International Women's Day, and we have a number of initiatives around women in STEM. The one that impresses me the most is, is the Girl Guides, Dee. I, I really enjoy working and, and visiting that project where we partnered with the Irish Girl Guides around uh, robotics um, and, uh, and robotic challenges. Um, and discussing with the girls who come in for those camps, and we were too, the Rising has just introduced uh, the engineering badge. Um, the Irish Girl Guides have introduced an engineering badge. Um, that in working with those young women, um, and here's one of these anecdotes where the sample size is the people I talked to at lunch. But uh, in, in asking them about would it not have been better if, if, if it was, a, you know, this is your weekend, would it be better for, you know, if you would have they are, they are, they are, they are girl guides, and it's the, it's the Irish girl guide, so it's the, it's the all-female guide, of course. They were absolutely 100% um, certain that this exercise for them would have been different if boys had been there. Not because of the strippers of three teens, I wouldn't have been, you know, I'd have been more interested in my appearance, but because they felt that traditionally this was a boy's space and they were being given access to it on their own terms. Um, boys might judge you, said one of the girls. Boys might judge you because they do this a lot and for us it's the first time. And, and Dee, I definitely think there's a bit of a research project to be done with the young women about the gender perceptions that are coming out of that, out of that project. So there's a bit of catching up to do, a bit of uh, work to be done on the, on the gender balance issues. The area that excites me most, apart from the Girl Guides project, is our work on the early years. Because the, the gender patterns and the dispositions towards science, towards materials, towards making, towards engineering, are formed in the three-year-olds. They're formed in the early years. And we're so lucky here in this institute to have both the National Institute for Digital Learning and the Bachelor of Early Childhood Education and a brand new center on, um, on research and early childhood education. And two important announcements that will be coming out of DCU shortly. One about support for computer science in schools. And a second about DCU's participation in a global partnership on the digital child to look at the impact of children on children's <coughs> lives of living and interacting and growing up and learning in the digital world. And this is a global partnership of universities uh, being run out of an Australian university. DCU will be a proud partner in this. More, so two more big announcements coming out of DCU in this space between now and the summertime. Have a great conference, I was following the, the great thing about the, your, your meets is that there, you can follow them from anywhere. So I really enjoyed uh, the Teach Week last night. I look forward to hearing Elizabeth tell you, talk about the proud history of, of SETI and its proud future. Um, we hope you'll come back for year 50 um, and we, we look forward to seeing you here again. I know many of you are connected with DCU. So I wish you, I wish you every success. I congratulate you on what you've achieved to date, um, when, when subject, new subjects are added to the school curriculum and getting a new subject into the school curriculum is a complex thing, 
People tend to focus it on the glory of the minister who makes the announcement. He gets the credit. The far-sighted minister who included computer science in the leading search curriculum. I want to pay tribute to the 45 years of very far-sighted dreamers of dreams uh, who spent long weekends, Saturdays, um, summer conferences, winter conferences, letters, mobilising committees, papers, working groups, and general agitation uh, that resulted in uh, it making uh, it making it as a subject. And I look forward to its impact, not just on how we think about computer science, but on the education system uh, more broadly. Have a great day as Lanaby arrives. Thank you very much. and for getting us off to an absolutely rousing start and putting it in context of where we are at the moment in the world of CS computers, but that broader picture that isn't just the CS aspect to it. Without further ado, I'll mention two people who are going to speak next. One is Elizabeth Oldham and the next is uh, Richard Millwood. Two people who have been soldiering for many years in this area, but soldiering with a smile on their face and a great deal of encouragement. I know I personally was a student of Elizabeth's at one stage, and she could definitely encourage me in great ways in terms of technology, and I'd say there are quite a few people here also who may have had that same experience. Richard is new, new, relatively new in this sphere here in Ireland. He's been with us just for a few years, but his impact has been as if he were here for many, many years. So if I could invite both Richard and Elizabeth, I'm handing over to you now. chance to share with you ideas that we both have, that we've both discussed over many years, and which we, broadly speaking, broadly speaking, agree about. But we also have our differences. Now, I don't suppose any of you have any allegiances um, to Scotland, is that correct? There are problems in the Of course, my great-grandmother's burden uh, of and um, so I, I obviously um, believe in Ireland uh, they're going to win, even though you can probably tell by my accent because I'm English. Um, Elizabeth has doubts. And what we want to do in a moment is just test our voting system um, with you. So we're handing out micro bits to you. I don't know how many people have not got one at all. We expect you might end up working in groups rather than as individuals because we don't have enough. So that should be fine. Keep your hand up if you, you don't have one. Now, I have three more in my pocket, Stephen, which are my own. I want to thank Stephen Howell for lending us the micro bits from uh, Microsoft. It's rather important that you hand them back to him. on with the talk, which will be in a moment. We want to use this as a way to focus discussion, and you know that there are voting tools you can buy. But the exciting thing here is that these guys helped me to program. These are CCS members from uh, Cork. Some of them, you might be like, is there anybody here? <laughs> you might recognize some of them as friends or colleagues from the past, I don't know. And um, I also want to thank various others, Keith Phil, um, Tony Riley, um, John Hegarty, with many others that have been supportive, if I didn't mention your name. And we're going to do a bit of name checking in this talk, aren't we? 
So um, if we get named, we miss people that are important, or we misunderstand what you're doing, then please, please tell us, you know, and do the message, do forgive us for, for failing on that front. Okay, so we have this vote to do, and if I press this button here, you'll see that me and Elizabeth are lighting up. We always light up in each other's company. <laughs> And you may notice that your microbit changes from a little, little dot to a square. Square means you can vote A or B. You might want to discuss before you decide to vote, because you're in pairs and fees. But do it reasonably quickly. <laughs> I'm sorry, you haven't missed it. Now you, you might have noticed that um, my 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 ring my ring is almost complete, and um, I'm sorry, Elizabeth, yours isn't. <laughs> and I shall be very happy if I'm wrong. Yeah. I'm going to stop the vote now, so your your micro bits should turn back to a single dot. I'd be interested to know if anybody doesn't. Yeah, all gone back to a dot. Yeah. Now this is absolutely. I can't, I'm wetting myself. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to come out from behind here to show you. And um, that's because only at half past seven this morning did I test this with three microbits. We've never done it with however many in the audience. So I have no idea how many there are. But there's, what, 50, 60? Good number anyway. So this is dead exciting. And the guys in Cork will be excited. And I hope Keith Hill's excited because... We're all partners in crime and, and writing the code that made this happen. We are playing with the technology. And that, to me, is a very, very important thing. That we as adults understand the value of play and enjoy it as, as I am. And I, I, hope, I have to say, I hope Elizabeth is. I had to soften Elizabeth up. Oh, no. Elizabeth I had to soften her up. Wonderful idea. I'm, I'm making it her a lovely flower to hide it. <laughs> <laughs> the killer outfit for a teenager. Okay. Now. And, and you can tell me off to my gender thinking later. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Especially yours. Well, you, oh, yes, well, your mine, mine, mine's on, their bones on the face. And that time's going to be too close. Oh, that's good. Send that. Where's the flower you're going to make? Where's the socket? So, what we'll do is now, we'll get on with the talk, and there's a few points in the talk where we'll do the vote again. I'm going to turn these off now. Uh, yours will stay with the single dot, and they won't come back on again until I press the vote button, so uh, you, you, no point in playing with this one again. Anybody who wants to program them to do ten votes rather than one vote will get a prize at the end. And you've got only 30 minutes to do that in. The result, oh sorry, the, the result was, um, you, you didn't see it, but I was, my one was right up to nearly the, 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 the end. So um, in effect, you all voted A except for a few. I don't know how many. Okay. And this is not an exact quantitative measure. <laughs> well, I hope Any other researchers in the room, please leave. <laughs> so, We've been watching films, haven't we? So I've been watching films. And we think we've had at least three billboards to show. <laughs> and I have to be told what the analogy was, because I'm actually not a great film watcher. There's no time, we're doing other interesting things. Anybody else want to be my partner next year? Yeah, there we go. Anyhow, I'm taking the bit about where have we been, and in fact, Anne has done a good deal of my talk for me, I think, which is great. Uh, so I will take it at speed, and I may ask some questions, but they're very factual, so we won't go into voting on those, you just wave hands if it comes up, and we leave the, the voting for the more thinky kind of things later on. But thinking of where we've been, and I wonder why, it, well, Anne more or less said why I was picked to do this, I've been around <coughs> a year or 45 uh, in Sessi. And if we go back to the birth of Sessi, credit where it's due. The department started off summer courses in programming in Fortran, you may have heard of it, and from the first couple of those, in fact, um, a, a steering committee leading to Sessi was formed. The lecturing at the summer courses was done by Professor Avi Bajpai from Loughborough in England, uh, originally before that from India, and you can see there what he saw as the role of these courses. It was on equipping the students for the computer age, focusing on developing the students. And remember, back then, there wasn't a cultural understanding of what computers could do. 
there was a lot of misunderstanding about what computers could do. So considerable focus went into trying to change that situation. And uh, well, Richard found this wonderful news clip here, newspaper from the old Irish press. Uh, January the 1st, 1973. That fella, little fella there in the picture should be called Baby Ceci. Uh, he's actually Baby Murphy, Christian name unspecified, and he arrived a few seconds after midnight that year, uh, the 1st of January. I don't suppose you're in the audience, are you, Baby Murphy? Anyone born on January the surname Murphy? No, apparently not. <coughs> Pity about that. But anyhow, there is he, just about a week older than Ceci. Because the first AGM and the foundation moment of Ceci happened on the 8th of January that year. And you see the objects declared, the first of four objects declared. And it's worth comparing it with what Anne has already quoted about our current men name. And they really are remarkably the same. The language has changed a bit, IT and very uh, 21st century standards as well as, uh, as principles, but we've stuck to our foundation myths, so to speak, and have kept going. Uh, the other objects are, I'd say, about support and advocacy. Uh, the support for the teachers of maths and other subjects. I don't know, is it maths and other subjects? Or is it maths and other subjects, which is the version I support. Uh, we'll come back to that. Um, anyhow, there it is. And I don't think now we can find out. But you see also a, a, a willingness to interface with many bodies, not just within education. Our first logo has uh, actually called on a punch card on it. I tried to find one to wave, and I, I, I couldn't. I think I finally threw them out. So anyhow, there we were starting off. And yes, rather as Anne has indicated, we did initially focus on computer studies uh, for the demythologizing bit I mentioned, but also because back then it was really the only thing in town. Yes, some computers were emerging, uh, sort of read from the right like the three billboards again. We could send stuff off by post to get it processed. And then Kadosh Kahn in Swords got a mini computer, massive excitement. And towards the end of the 70s and into the 80s, yes, microcomputers, so then called, began coming into the schools or the department, giving them into the early 80s. So we could actually do hands-on stuff with students. But one of the points about teaching computer studies was, well, if push came to shove, you didn't actually have to have a computer. And there were many who did it on a blackboard and checked out the programs themselves. Not only you, but there it was. So Ceci's role back then, very much advocacy, uh, badgering the department might be a way of, anyone here from the department? Um, uh, talking to the department might be a way of putting it on the introduction of computer courses. And yes, in the 1980s, and we talked about it more at the seminar last September, uh, we got first the Leaving Cert Maths option, and then the freestanding subject in the junior cycle. They seems died, but they were there. But, and I think again I made the point, we were about education, not technology, not computers for their own sake. We were about education and the people involved in education, and some of them are shown in the picture and about collaborating with other bodies, ICL, the British Computer Company, CES, Computer Education in Schools, they worked with SESI in the early years when we took over giving the summer courses, and their mantra was, computers are about people. Who's that in the center of the photograph? Um, <laughs> well, I was younger then. And the sad thing actually here, there are three, the three guys from SESI were the great and the good. They were wonderful, inspiring people. The guy from ICL helped us a lot there. I think I'm last man, last woman standing. I think they're all gone. Uh, which was sad. Uh, they went on time with some of them. But wonderful people inspired about education for students. 
And this was Ceci engaging, therefore, in teacher support. And that's always been so important to us. I, I won't always stop to say it. We did, in the early years of those summer courses, try to emphasize other things as well as computer studies and programming. We talked about computers as an aid in teaching and learning. But we tended to talk about what we would have to talk about, what happened in other countries, because we didn't have the software or initially the machines to run it on. We could do a little better on computers and administration, because they are north of border in Portora. They had a link to a computer in Derry. And uh, Chris Dawkins, notice we were 32 County back then, uh, Chris Dawkins teaching in the school did quite a lot to produce class lists and so on and convert his colleagues to seeing how useful computers could be for their daily work. But when we do get into the 1980s, things started happening on a broader scale. There was educational software. There were computers to run it on. And crucially important, from around 1982, the primary sector was deeply involved. Up to then, we had been rather post-primary. And the energy from primary came into SESI, and I hope some went back the other way as well. Uh, yes, there was our only tutorial software. How many people here, however, remember Adventure Games Granny's Garden? Hands up if you ever used Granny's Garden. Some of you have been definitely underprivileged in life, but there are an awful lot. It was the archetypal adventure game. There's a wicked witch in it, so it was the basis of many of several weeks long Halloween project. Um, there was also the likes of Logo, a bit of a niche subject, but a very strong group interested in um, programming where it was very child-centered and it had a very low floor and a high ceiling. So our mantra then was across computers, across the curriculum, or if we go on a little, the language became uh, IT integration. And that was what we were perhaps emphasizing most at that time. It broadened itself as we began getting the applications packages, and probably even more when uh, email, and then of course all the excitement of the internet do you even remember the initial browsers? Mosaic with the scribbly S and uh, Netscape with the N. Um, really, suddenly, things happening, perhaps more exciting than programming, or so we thought at the time. Uh, there was the question, as we went on with our advocacy for IT integration, what was the emphasis one should give to skills? And we still hear that today. Uh, some of us would have said, teach the skills up front and then use the packages or whatever. Others would have said, ah, you pick up enough skills by uh, actually using computers for something. I don't think it's resolved. Our documents to the Curriculum and Examinations Board, the green paper, sorry for some of, the, some of you that was before you were thought of, uh, will have advocated broadly IT integration and maybe taken a bit of a party line on that one. Um, we didn't, of course, invent all those applications I've shown you. We did our own things too. Branches, the Dublin branch dates from 1974. There was a newsletter early on, but uh, it definitely became sort of posher. Um, I have one copy of Reverish in a Skull here that Michael Moynihan produced when he was chairperson, and then a more upmarket newsletter, um, including things on logo in it from just that bit later. And the SESI conferences, there's a, a brochure from an early one there. And perhaps also particularly to emphasize, this was where we began working closer to the students in school. Dublin Millennium, maybe slightly spurious, 1988, the student fair. Groups of students, primary, post-primary, techie, totally non-techie, came, and they used and showcased good educational activities facilitated by technology. It might be something very posh and more saleable programming-wise. It might be a big project using Granny's Garden or word processing. The point was, it was good education stuff. And there was great excitement among the kids there at the fairs. High voltage is a quotation from the very first one. And over this time, as well as being involved in all these things, we were keeping up our, please 
government or whatever do this, that, and the other. And we were going up in the world. We were even meeting with the ministers for education at time to time. And this was as we moved towards policy finally coming into being rather more in the education system, notably at the end of the 90s. And a fair number of SESI people really got involved in the activities that were then started uh, at national level or in some cases at local level. Uh, so you began to think, was a person wearing his or her SESI hat or his or her RT2000 hat or whatever it might be? Uh, we were perhaps a little bit spreading ourselves over the system and maybe losing a little of our own identity. And in particular, in the early 2000s, perhaps the role of branches came into question. They weren't flourishing. Now, the Dublin branch, there's Joe, uh, the, the Dublin branch uh, had been a great pillar of SESI, as others were, but it, somehow it wasn't what people needed now. And then there was the question of membership and paying for membership and who was a member of SESI. Um, so something had to happen, and it did. <laughs> Any guesses as to what I've chosen as the tipping point to the modern session? The mailing list. John Hegg, where are you? Uh, it was formed in 2007 but became operative from 2008. And then we had solved the problem. If you're on the list, you're a member of SESI. And this developed the SESI online community, which has been so important for teacher support. I found the document that's retyped here only yesterday, and I'm not too sure of its problems. Overall, it looks a little bit like the executive saying, look, we're practicing what we preach, we're doing all these good things, um, doing them by way of teacher support. But I've highlighted two things that need mentioning that so far I haven't uh, talked about. The teach meets and the research projects, including the iPod Touch project. Again, teacher support, peer-to-peer -peer teacher support, people supporting each other out there with a SESI flag somewhere in the background. And then, of course, and I've used this analogy before, back to the future and has talked about the reemergence of computer science, computing, and indeed computational thinking, uh, that one across the curriculum. Suddenly we're back where we were in our very early years, advocating also for computing courses and content and skills related to computational thinking, including at primary level. So in a way, the wheel has turned full circle at last, as one might say, thanks Anne, and um, there we are, looking forward to our next five years and then our, our big anniversary. And as I see it, I've summarized the roles of SESI up to this period as advocacy with those in the system, maybe, I don't like above, uh, up there somewhere anyway, and teacher support, the peer group all working together in our various ways for all IT-related activities in education. That's my personal view over the past, and we can dialogue about it later. But maybe the moment has come to hand over to what we're up to now, and to pass the ball, I'm thinking it was out to pass the ball. <laughs> yes. Ah, I'm sorry, but it's such a last minute of putting this slide just yesterday. I don't know what's so it befalls me just to say something about current SESI activities that <coughs> I personally think are worth relating in case you don't know about them. And, and, and if you do all know about all the things that SESI does, then forgive us. But um, I'm going to start with community, and we've already mentioned John Hegarty, and we've already mentioned Teach Meets, but I can't help but mention SESI CS, which is my own baby in the sense of working towards uh, facilitating communities around Ireland. So I've been to seven centres now, some of them three times already, and there's a few more next week and in, in the weeks to come. Um, this is the chaps in Donegal who won the prize for the first round meeting with the biggest number of teachers. And um, the enthusiasm shown by every single group, whether it's only been two people in some cases, up to the 16 in Donegal, 
the enthusiasm and the commitment, the um, engagement has been amazing to me and made the work for a very, very great pleasure. Um, and you can see that I've been caught up in it with my own adventures with, with um, uh, wearables and, uh, and, 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 and micro bits. Um, but then there's curriculum development. This, is, this, I think, is very interesting. And I've probably got the names wrong and haven't included the right names, so please correct me from, from the floor if you wish to. Just shout it out. Um, I believe ABM has been involved in the, in the digital strategy work and been a been yeah, successive yeah. representative. Oh, she's just there, she's smiling and stuff. I think I'm safe for that one. But was there anybody else on the same committee from our own uh, posse? I don't know. So um, forgive me. Leaving certificate, I know John has been involved, but I know there are others in the audience and others, members of SETI, that uh, have been part of the development team and, and, and the work. Connor, of course, um, uh, with the junior cycle short course in Philly. And Tony with his primary stuff, and I'm helping a little bit with that, I suppose, I need a corner of that. And it's exciting that these are all members of the SESI executive. Not, I, I don't wish to somehow elevate them to gods, or sound a bit like that. I'm simply pointing out these are committed SESI people to promoting the organization and, and building it. And at the same time, they're promoting and building the national picture in these central roles in the Britain development. And I think that's exciting to SESI. It's worth saying, apart from the deep digital strategy, of course, all of those, the last three, are all about coding and computing and programming. And um, that shift in emphasis is something we're going to, I hope, to disagree about at some point in the future. And then there's the relationship with elsewhere. We have Miriam and Elizabeth, at least, um, involved with the third level computing forum. And we do have SESI members, and I, I had at least two SESI CS meetings with third level representatives, no, three in fact, um, around the country. And they, they bring a, a huge uh, value to the meeting. When you have a third level down to primary and early years level, people talking together and working together on the same project and, and seeing each other as equals. There's, there's something special about that. And it begins to build understanding, which I think we need. And SESI can play the role in doing that. Of course, Mags, who can't be here today, is our SESI ambassador. Which, so she goes out there and promotes us, and in particular through her post COVID EU work, um, uh, which is interesting. Um, Elizabeth Oldham, who's she? Oh, yes. Elizabeth Oldham um, has been recently to the Association for Teacher Education Europe, which is a long standing member and participant. And President? No, no. Well, you were something big there. I don't know what it was. Uh, this person who's been around a long time. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, leave, I'll leave that one. But, um, certainly, you've been consistently attending the meetings and promoting uh, CETI's work. There. And finally, um, uh, there are so many. Uh, amongst you in the audience who are research engaged, I've called it, where research is the broadest possible way you can think about research. And um, we indeed, as SESI, have organized our own award for research in our community. So there's, there's a nice feeling of being engaged with academia there as well. Um, so I'm going to move on to what next. But, now this is really a bit of a, what's the word for it when you indulge yourself? <laughs> is it? <laughs> I'm going to tell you my ideas about what are, what are the problems coming up, the set of problems. What are the opportunities coming up? So I have a big slide full of issues. I'm not going to touch all of those. I don't know how much time I've got left, but it won't be enough to go through all of those in great detail. So I'm going to put on a few and say something about some of them. But that gives you the headlines of things that I think we as a community ought to be uh, concerned with. I'm going to start with the, 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 the transfer one. I think it's reasonably well known, and there's a few people in the audience with academic credentials way beyond mine that would probably agree with me that there's been a concern that we invite children to learn how to problem solve with computers and they don't transfer that capability into other subject areas and other disciplines. And if, that's, if I'm wrong about that, then you can tell me now. But I think that's a problem. And so my answer to that is one emerging answer, a suggestion for SESI, is that we start teaching our computation and at least recognizing computational thinking and computing in the other disciplines. And we don't necessarily think that the establishment of the leading certificate is the end of the art teacher teaching computing. Okay? But maybe the beginning of that. Now, how that gets organized and how that happens, I don't know. But I've been so impressed. And so here, I want you to vote on this. Do you, do you agree with me? Um, I say computing is everywhere. Art teachers may have the best aptitude to teach computing indeed. And of course, Elizabeth, I'm caricaturing. Is that right? It's definitely caricaturing. So I, I argue against that one, but we take it for the purposes of the We argue more about how can we argue than we did about arguing. So, so can, can you, um, uh, perhaps you can see on your micro bits, um, the voting table. You can vote your A's or B's now. We haven't got long, so please be quick. Have a, have a word with your name. <laughs> Is 
So if you haven't voted, I'm about to switch off. The last chance to come in. Right, so I switched off. And you'll see that if you were watching, my one went up pretty high. But most of you do think that um, art teachers may have the best attitude. Um, for all of um, this rather colourful. Orange. I'm green. That means I'm right. <laughs> Sorry, that's a fight. <laughs> Joke. We're not, we don't know the answers to these entirely. But what I do know is that when I was 15 years old in school, um, I was told how to draw a painting by an algorithm. I don't think I ever thought it's computational thinking. I don't think the teacher did either. But there's certainly a step-by-step -step guide here, which you might want to follow yourself if you've got a bit of paper. You're mad if you do, there's no time for it. You should draw, you draw three zigzag lines like that, yeah? And having done that, you extend them off into the distance, okay? And I haven't, um, you get a ruler out and do it lightly with a pencil. I haven't um, done them all because it took too long to make this PowerPoint slide already. And, um, and then, having done that, you can paint in the sections. And again, I haven't done them all, but you use different colours for different sections. Colours colors of the sky at the top, uh, black and whites and greys in the middle for the mountains, and then sort of darker greens and browns for the foothills, and the landscape below is rolling pastoral countryside, so you can paint that, obviously, in tarmac. Um, this is the painting I made. My mum gave it back to me last summer. I was so delighted. I just forgot all about it, although I hadn't forgotten the experience of doing it. So you can work out for yourself the kind of person I am. I'm a bit mathematical. I'm a bit controlling. I'm not really very free in my thinking. At least I'm, I wasn't then. And I certainly, at the time, found it liberating to work with my algorithmic kind of mathematical mind on a painting where I still had to make aesthetic judgments about colours and shapes rather than, like any child does when they're colouring in. And I felt I'd made myself something I was pleased with. So this is an example where in art you might consider the possibility of being to explore um, uh, algorithmic thinking and, and so on in a very, a very modest kind of way. And of course if you want to extend it in art, you can then go on and write the programme. So this is the programme that I wrote just in September or October using Turtle Stitch, which is a variant of Scratch. And the Turtle Stitch program has the wonderful property of being able to output its results onto a piece of cloth and embroidery. And you can come and see that in my workshop later if you want to. I've got the machine with me and you can do a bit of stitching. It is absolutely engaging. And Andrea Mayer Stolder from, from Vienna who invented this, when she showed her slides two weeks ago um, at a seminar we had, showed us boys with these stitches. It wasn't a gendered thing for them. And I think that's exciting to hear, isn't it? Because you have this natural idea, oh, it's a girl, isn't it? But it is not. Moving on then, another problem I think we have is about continuity and progression. And I mean the, the problem of knowing what to teach when in what order, and how to help a child move on to something more challenging, or to decide to step back. Thank you. So, I don't know what the answer to that would be, but I do know about in the, in the English context, they have a thing called Project Quantum, where they're crowdsourcing computing questions. Asking teachers to submit their questions, and therefore building up a database of them, and beginning to understand and assess them as a body of work, and how different things are uh, in different ways. So, I only recommend that to you to have a look at. I don't recommend it's necessarily the answer. But there's, there's certainly some collaborative activity that Ceci could be involved in to start helping to make sense, particularly between the primary and secondary, because we know that the primary kids are doing amazing things. We know that most of them won't do those amazing things at some point, but we want to know how we not to bore the secondary child who comes along having done those amazing things, and how we to do the right progression. Okay. And then there's conflicting goals. This is something we argue about. Okay. So on the one hand, we have the nation's needs, we have businesses' demands, but we also have the interest of the development of students at heart. Okay. Now, I don't agree about that. <laughs> Obviously, without a, a successful business sector, there'll be no money for education. So we must ensure we have the employable population to fill up all those big office spaces all around Dublin with programmes. I don't mind it being done, but the important thing is the students and the student and the personal development of that student. So now I am talking to my own. So I think I've set the voting down. Is it time to square? Have a chat. <laughs> Thank you.
You just can't get the programming stuff. So let's stop that. You can see that from my one, this is this is the percentage of like the proportion of votes that I won, which is about a quarter, maybe a little less. And if I stop the vote now, you can see that um, that's I think that's gone wrong. <laughs> Not to worry, not to worry. So most of you agree with Elizabeth, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. And it's a reminder that things like the leaving certificate aren't necessarily everybody doing it. It's an easy thing to, to mistake if you're a member of the public thinking what's going on in your education. I think the, 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 <coughs> right. I, I think the learner fulfillment is, is the number one thing, especially primary. And we should be concerned about um, our learners right at the centre of our thinking. I haven't got time to go through this. You're going to have to go and find it on my blog. But it's, in a, it's, it's a kind of analysis of, well, what should the learner be asking about their education? And of course, they, they, they can't necessarily do that. They're not necessarily um, able to answer these questions themselves. We can at least imagine ourselves in their position. We can empathise with their position and ask the question, are we taking care of the answers to those questions properly? And helping them to A, know them and do the for themselves. And um, I, I, I think there's a big role for learning theory here. This is a big thing for me, is learning theory. Not that I know anything about it, really. Um, this is Peter Cook, of course. Peter Cook and Dudley Moore, you might remember. Um, but I did do this chart a few years ago. It's the most popular thing I've ever published. And all it is, is a rehash of Wikipedia into a concept map. You know? That's all it is. And I'm very delighted that it's been so popular. Because what it shows you is just how much learning theory is out there. Yeah? How many theorists, how many disciplines, and how many different concepts and paradigms there are. Okay? So people like it for that reason, it sort of maps the territory. But how the hell is a teacher to make sense of that? Or any, or any growing person working in learning, how is a child to make sense of all that? So I think it's um, a problem. I think it's a contested area that you, you know about. Contested rather more in the past than in the present. And um, uh, one of the big questions I have is, um, I'm, I'm pretending, of course, Ray, I, mean, I don't think Elizabeth is, would you say that, you're, that that's your... So quick chance to vote, no time for discussion. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, keep going. Oh, it's gone down again. But why has it gone down? Because the proportion of votes for me is... Yeah? That means there's more working for Elizabeth. Sorry, Elizabeth, things not working. So let, let me stop it. It's not very important to go on. Clearly, Elizabeth's right, and Anne's, and Anne's right. There is a role for both here, and, we, and, and yet, constructivism arguably has won the constructivist behaviourist debate, I think, in, in the strong sense of being the predominant theory and the, the, the major part of what we think of how children learn. And I, I believe that is my own uh, analysis of it. Only notable. Um, my analysis of um, what I call expressive construction by the blue rectangle. Because most learning theorists didn't live in the era where there were computers. So they haven't incorporated into the thinking the self-direction and the value that computers bring to the learning piece where children can make their formal expressions, things like spreadsheets, computer programs and others, which can be responsive to their designs and come back with results without actually asking a teacher for right or wrong or even another peer. That isn't necessarily a good thing. I still believe in the, in the pink block and the ye yellow block as being vital to learning, of course. But the blue block brings an extra dimension. And we need to be remembering that when we design new curricula, new things. OK. And then, oh, I don't know why I put this up here. I put this up because I've just had to develop this recently. This is not really my work. Um, I just stole the, the metaphor of head, hand, and heart and tried to establish what I think are if you like, more formal words for those things. And I'm particularly interested in the craft. When Anne said in the beginning about uh, the students being um, literate, I want to say they've also got to be crafty. Crafty. And I use crafty in every sense you want to think about it. And you can see that from my stitching work to crafty as in smart and clever and, and, and savvy. Yeah? And, and, that, and these overlap terribly. You know, crafty is a kind of disposition as well. It's part of your character. But knowledge is not enough. Being literate is not going to be enough in my view. You've got to have a bit more than that. And craft comes about through skills. Skills to me are the minor thing. Craft is the main thing.
Here's all the procedures you do, you follow, um, and you know. But craft is something you get from practice. My younger son's a pianist. He is crafty in the piano. Okay? Because he's done thousands of hours of practice. So to me, these are these are quite interesting things that need to be elaborated better and more simply. So teachers and us, <coughs> all of us, can understand what the hell we're doing with, with, with learning. All right. Now, the last thing. This is my last slide. You'll be pleased to know, uh, Adrian. So uh, quickly, um, there's a concern about practice from research. Like, I, I clearly, even though I don't feel I'm an academic, belong in academia. And, <laughs> and I'm always concerned, well, how do teachers take on research? And I'm indebted to Dermot Walsh, another SESI tech member in the audience, for you know, elaborating this idea of there being a kind of brick wall around them. And of course, there are the theories of the research. There's motivation and leadership coming from various people. There's their own self-efficacy beliefs and perceptions and instincts, all there as foundations for their adoption of research and practice. But out there is media and political and parent pressure boxing them in. Their own learning experience sometimes boxes you in because you resort to that when you're stuck. And CPD, I don't know whether that's boxing you in or helping you. And then curriculum and inspection, definitely we're beginning to get into trouble now, aren't we? Observation by management, exams, tradition, environment and resources. No wonder that that poor old brick in the middle is now completely surrounded. And um, we might say to ourselves, I'll get on and do it in my own place. Thank you very much. So that's my, that's, those are challenges to setting, is what I'm saying. All of those things we've been through, I'm going to rush now. So the conclusion slide, I promise, Adrian, that's all there is to do. And I don't think we need to read that out. We'll leave it up there while we stop. Thank you. Well, on behalf of myself and everybody here, I'd like to thank Elizabeth and Richard for that very thought-provoking session and in truth you could have I think the entire rest of the day starting from that point and taking the various issues and questions and thought-provoking and tease them out so all you can do is nab them during the day Elizabeth did say she might be here later on um, but that discussion will continue it has to continue with education because we are dynamic it's not stationary, and we've got to move, we've got to change, and we've got to take on board the world that is around us. And as we said, we're shaping tomorrow today, and we have to bear that in mind. So again, thank you so much for having me. Really well Thank you very much. Thank so without further ado, the programme is in front of you there and you will have made your choices no doubt at this stage. Obviously because of weather conditions we have lost one or two presenters, but thankfully not too many and we thank them for offering in the first place. Um, there are two presentations I would like to draw your particular attention to because I think we're very fortunate. Uh, the one is at 11.30, it's the far right of the sheet, Shaping Tomorrow's Problem Solvers Today. And we're very honoured by having some students here from um, the Altramas National School. And the reason that they're here is they actually made it to the national final of the Bedworth competition, which some of you may or may not be familiar with. It's been around for a few years, but in the last uh, year and a half or so, it has increased in, its, in people's awareness of it. And the other one that I think we're very privileged to have is if you go to the 1430 and you see Evie and Langham, Evie was uh, declared the EU Digital Girl of the Year 2017-2018 into the 11 to 14 year old category. And I think it takes out the point that um, I think was made earlier on that we have a lot of learning to do as well from our students. Because I personally was not brought up in the digital world. I've had to learn it, I've had to acquire my knowledge and I have to become familiar with it. But the generations that are in front of us in the classroom don't know any other world. And I think we have a two-way learning and in a situation which traditionally would have been teacher, student, one direction, but now it's multi-directional. So for that point of view, <clears throat> I just want to take, draw your attention to it. Um, I want to pay tribute to our media team who should have been with us, our red shirts who have been with us for the last good number of years and bring an entire added value to the conference. They were committed to coming to us last week, but again, they, we lost them because of the weather and prior commitments. But I would pay tribute to the fact that Pam O'Brien, who's somewhere here in the audience, had them all organised to be with us. So thank them for us, Pam, please. And we're just sorry that the weather got in the way. 
Off you go, enjoy yourselves. The rooms are 200 are on this floor, 300 are on the up floor. Oh, sorry, sorry. Can we have them back, please? The micro bits. This is your micro bits back to Stephen. I'll be paying for you to go first in the afternoon. So, three somewhere off the back there that are mine as well. So, those will be here. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move swiftly on to our first ses session here in the room. So, I'm going to welcome our presenter, 
Nicholas Folks. She is teaching principal of Lincoln Community National School in Dublin. She's committed to fostering a culture of creativity and innovation in her school. She encourages her staff on a whole school level to develop students' computational thinking, critical thinking, and problem-solving skills. And of course, she uses technology. They integrate it from junior infants to third class, and her school is continuing to grow year on year. So we really look forward to hearing your story, Nicola, and I'm sure we're all going to take a lot from it. Can you all hear me? If I move this way, can you still hear me? As you can see, I have difficulty standing my podium and I tend to move quite a bit. So um, I'm aware that we're a little uh, shortened on time. So um, I suppose I'm going to start by sharing, I suppose, a little story. Yes, teacher, we love telling stories. But there, about a week or two ago, I had, um, I did it several times with children and we were talking about our values and who we are as children and the third class. And I suppose I'm background to these children, I am teaching principal, but I've been teaching principal of these children since we opened up the school. So these children are now currently in third class. So we were talking about our values, what was important to us and you know who I am. So the children were so I talking about who I am and you know they all talked about well, you know, I am I, I am one of the girls that I'm a really good mathematician. I'm a fool. And the other children were like, but how do you know that? So we kept going around and the children, I don't know whether it was competition between one another, they started coming up with lots of different different roles that they saw. And you know, we had creators, we had engineers, and we had artists like so on, and one boy in particular, Christopher. He said, actually, you know what, I'm everything. And I was poor. Oh. So on one hand, I said, God, isn't this wonderful, this is what I've been striving for all these years. On the other hand, I was thinking, oh, gosh, okay, I'm either setting up this child for a massive fall later on, or, I, or am I sending him out there with this, this uh, would we call it um, an arrogance of sorts, or am I really creating this amazing platform for that child where he is genuinely everything. He sees, he believes that he can be anything. And I suppose that is really what is at the heart and soul of this new school that we created five years ago. And in terms of, you know, and I think it, it, it follows on very well in relation to Richard's uh, last talk there, you know, we talked about the child. And when we talk about child-centered education, it's always about where the child is at. You know, it's children. They come to us with this amazing, this effervescent um, sense and this uh, unfettered enthusiasm for life. They believe anything is possible. And you know, children, actually they don't ask why. <laughs> you ever notice they always ask, you know, why not? <laughs> you know, they are always looking to the impossible and trying to make the impossible possible. So in terms of looking at, you know, the four C's, um, of you know of 21st century learning, you know there are many C's. But in terms of looking at creativity, looking at critical thinking, looking at um, communication, and you know really looking at I suppose changing the world. When we set up the school five years ago, it was very much set up as a future-focused school. We would equip these children with the skills that they would need to create their own job. It was a given. Parents very much entrusted uh, their children with us. They believed in the vision, even though there was no school village there. Um, and, um, and it is, I suppose, it's a vision and it's a promise that we have made to parents to ensure that that does happen. And today, in terms of looking at the four C's, also the strategies, how do we create that environment? How do we make sure as educators, as principals, who are handed these amazing minds of many possibilities, how do we ensure that it isn't going to be just one set of children in my class? How do I ensure that the children coming in behind that will have that same sense of the what is possible for them? And so we're going to be very briefly looking at strategies. Um, and you know, I'm, I so this is a, a word of caution, <laughs> coding. We that should really be replaced here with critical thinking, that this, um, I suppose this, this lecture isn't so much about coding, and I know it's one of these keywords that's being thrown around, it is about computational thinking, it's about critical thinking, it's about equipping them with the skills naturally.
actually sold in their every movement, in their every engagement within the school. And that is so true for Forsys. It is very dependent on asking questions. It is very dependent on communication. If those children do not have those communication skills, they cannot access creativity. It isn't about looking at an iPad and stuff to that. You know, the reality is we have never in this present day had so many different avenues to engage with so many different people on so many you know platforms. But actually we actually have one of the highest percentages of young people feeling so alone. You know, so technology, uh, I suppose the purposeful use of technology is is so, you know, we talk about it being important, but it is never so important as it is now with, with this coming generation. Um, so without, um, yes, so I suppose, yes, there are challenges, or as I like to say, opportunities. Um, so in terms of looking at this philosophy as educators, you know, we seek to teach children, and we want our children to learn, but actually, those children, not only, yes, they're there to learn, but actually they want to discover, they want to be engaged, they want to be active in their own learning. If children are not active from a very early age on, they are not actually going to be able to transfer those skills, such as Richard mentioned, of critical thinking. If they haven't got that in the practical sense, they cannot access the abstract. So actually, where we really need to be started with is the children in the school. It is looking at the type of curriculum that we are going to provide for our children. It is looking at the strategies and how we are going to ensure that that is long lasting. Um, you know, it is about collaboration. If we're looking at communication, communication is so vital for those children. If they cannot speak, they cannot articulate their thoughts. If they cannot articulate their thoughts, we do not know what is preventing them in terms of accessing the, the answers or the possibilities for them. By articulating and by discussing and collaborating with their peers as young as four and five years of age, they are listening to another viewpoint, another way of doing something. They are looking at how another child may do it. They are watching out and able to pick up on the strengths and weaknesses working in groups. And they are able to put those together and work within groups to solve problems. And creating is all part of that. And it's creating <coughs> new possibilities, endless possibilities, and the importance there in terms of giving them this, this platform for they and scaffolding that learning for all of their different strengths and weaknesses, where they can bring those together to create something. And that changing there, you know, when we talk about future focused education, you know, it's really important that you know we look at the type of world we have now, <clears throat> you know, our children, we are now in this technological era and dare I say, you know, there is this disruptive technology. You know, a year ago, if you look at these multi-billion businesses, you had Macklin, Toys R Us, uh, I think Claire's Accessories was one of them, you know, a year's time, they've all gone bust. Why? Because of disruptive technology. Not our generation, but the generation coming. They're deciding to shop online. They are the ones disrupting. And yes, it's always been that society has been disrupted by change, but never with technology at the height of which it is now. So, you know, it is about changing, and it's seeing, um, I suppose, it's making sure that our children are, that we are where they're at, that we are providing those platforms as as much as possible for them in terms of moving forward. Um, so in terms of looking at your critical thinking, communication, collaboration, when we set up the school, obviously we set up with junior infants, uh, we started up with 17 children, and we very much looked at uh, a programme where we would be very much focusing in on all four of those. This is what we sold our school on, this is what we sold our vision on. In terms of the critical thinking, communication, collaboration, creativity, all of those four would be completely embedded in every curriculum subject that we would do. Not just in terms of delivering the curriculum, but also in our way of being, in the spaces that we would provide for our children. In my classroom, there is no top or bottom to my room. The secretary will pop her head in and she has difficulty finding where I'm at. I'm actually sitting in with the children. It's very much a space that moves, it flows, it changes. Some days the children will change those spaces. And it's about working from 
where we are at that moment. And when we talk about a way of being, it's how we as a staff, in terms of developing our curriculum, in terms of doing all of those plans for the threaded WSC to, to come our way, you know, it's really coming on all of us that we are all viewing how we teach, how we interact, how we engage, how we develop those skills through the lens of those four. And in terms of critical thinking, you know, analyzing, affirming, evaluating, interpreting, generating questions and reasoning, you can't do all of that unless our children can communicate. Okay, and it's through the collaboration that the communication skills get better. We've also heard Richard there talking about you know, evidence-based action practice or action research. A lot of the work that we did, especially the first and second year, were all based on studies that I, so I was part of at the time. Um, it was built on other studies of other teachers coming in. And it was always looking to evidence-based practice. What it said out there about what we're doing. What, look, let's look at the work that has been done. What doesn't work? What does work? Look at where we're actually at. What can we take from that and bring into our curriculum? And what is, would be more suitable for us to need to decide? Um, in terms of our whole school approach, it's a four-tiered process. A moment we're up to third class. And of course, we're always looking ahead. We've been very fortunate that we were given a complete blank canvas to start with. Um, and um, we, you know, I suppose we've just been really fortunate in terms of that. There's always been something else coming out, along that just fitted at just the right time. Um, long may it last. But in terms of our four years approach, here we have our junior, which is consists of the junior and senior. There's our first and second class, our third and fourth, and our fifth and sixth class. So here in terms of the language, the creativity, the critical thinking, the problem solving with infants, it is about language. It's very much focused on your, the B box, okay? So those programized robots, um, focusing on the language, looking at a stationed approach, children working in groups for mixed stability. This again was part of a research study from my masters at the time. Um, and it really focused on you know, and many themes emerging for children, and most of our most children starting were four years of age. Um, there were about what, uh, nearly 60, 65% of those children were EAL, English as an additional language. They would have come to me with little or no English. By the end of eight weeks program with the BBOX, those children were able to do up to 40 sets of instructions within that BBOX. They were able to direct their peers having learned the language from one another in groups, they were able to follow directions. They were able to take the learning from a very practical state and they were able to transfer it to the likes of the BBOT robot, um, or sorry, the BBOT app at the time. And with on, on those iPads, each child had their own, we were actually able to see how they were getting on and, pro and the progress that they were making. We would have tested them before, during, and after to see and we actually find a lot of different themes uh, were emerging, such as self-correcting, which is something I actually find it hard to make. Children would probably be capable of doing really at the age of four, and um, you know where they discovered when they were programming the BBOT to move around, um, that they discovered they made a mistake. And I said, look, you know, don't stop if you've made a mistake. And they actually undid the the procedure that they put in and redid it the correct way. That's a child of four years of age, for whom English actually wasn't his first language. Okay, so um, in terms of the BBOT, again, it is never taught as an add-on. That eight-week program was part of our English curriculum, our maths. We were able to integrate and we teach Chinese, so we go English, Irish, Chinese, all the way through. Um, so we were able to integrate it into Chinese in terms of the different themes that you would be doing for your maths, your mapping for geography, your sequencing for stories, it is all encompassing. And this is where it's really important that, you know, that this isn't seen as an add-on. It is a way of being, it's just how we do things. Um, and again, those four C's um, developed in a cross-curricular um, cross way. Again, I suppose in terms of immersing the children within the technology, this is one of my children, uh, well not my own child, my child I teach, teach. <laughs> um, but I do feel they are my own. Um, and this was sharing scratching, this is the 
end of junior infants. Um, and we had just been toying it with, uh, we were looking at presentation skills for the last one, but we had taken out the Scottish Junior, and actually we would bring the parents in, and the children would be teaching the, the doing a little class that would be preparing for it on the Thursday, and the parents would come in on the Friday. And um, so here Roisin was just explaining it. Welcome, my name is... <laughs> Yeah. 
class, we would have been running for the last two, maybe two and a half years. We have that going in all of our classes. We do have an EDU breakout room, but actually recently we're using other spaces around the school, depending on, for instance, if I'm creating the EDU breakout in around, you know, Matt's angles recently, there was one particular corner of the school downstairs where, where I thought, oh my God, this would be perfect. You know, and it's creating those spaces that it's, you know, I suppose we talk about mobile learning, you know, it's lear you know, mobile learning, any place, any time, you know, anywhere. Um, and here the children are engaged as well. This is your computational thinking, your problem solving skills, working in groups, collaborating, and a little bit of competition thrown in there, which they love. Um, and, um, you know, it's bringing out all of those four C's. Um, from the whole school approach, you know, we're, we are currently in third class, we're moving into fourth class next year. We are already working with the likes of Swift, we're working with the Arduinos. Um, we're, I suppose, looking to best practice elsewhere and how we're going to incorporate that within the curriculum. Um, I, I suppose we're working now with, uh, with the NCCA as well, with the new um, maths, uh, critical thinking, <laughs> computational thinking uh, curriculum that will be coming out as part of it. And all of this is feeding into it. And I suppose the beauty of that is that we're able to look at best practice everywhere, you know, where because obviously not every school is fortunate enough to be able to start from scratch, but there's amazing practice going on in schools throughout the country. And bringing all of those together and to say, well, you know, it isn't actually just that fourth class that you would start to bring Lego robotics in. It's actually possible to do it in senior events. And this is how it was done. It's actually possible to ensure that the children are able to take on scratch in fourth class if they have all of this done as well. And you're not way I suppose taking a whole entire lesson or two or you know perhaps a day in total of time to teach children specifically what each of those procedures mean. Um, and um, so in terms of the creativity, you know, creativity is so important in terms of the innovation. You know, but actually what really underpins the creativity is is how we foster all of those other skills that are required for our children moving forward. And, you know, I suppose to allow our children to really, you know, allow them to still, when they move on into second level and further, uh, you know, that they aren't asking why, but asking why not, and let me show you actually it can be done. So, um, yeah, it's not a challenge rather, it's, it's a great opportunity. So thank you.
Graduate Schools come September. There's a pilot program taking place this year, so we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Again, I know we are a few minutes behind time. If you have some questions, keep them until the end, and I'm sure you will take questions um, during break time also. So we'll get started. Morning, everyone. Um, so, as you yeah, said, my name is Rolly, I'm an advisor with PDFT, and uh, my colleague Shane will take over as well halfway through. So, we're just going to have a look at an overview of the digital learning framework. Um, these are some of the sort of objectives that we plan to get through just for this session, just to familiarize ourselves with the objectives layer and content of the framework to outline some of the key policy documents that went into um, formulating the framework and to explore the six projects involved in writing a digital learning plan. And also we will be exploring some of the support materials to raise schools in, in coming up with their digital learning plan. I just want to draw your attention to circular 01 uh, 2018. Um, this came out in February of this year. Um, in it each school it states it's expected to draw a digital learning plan and that it needs to be reviewed and updated at least annually. One important part of it would be the bit that I highlighted there on the slide that states that in, fu in future years funding will be dependent on schools having to submit a digital learning plan to um, the department that evidence of it would be required. Um, that's as much as we know about it. Uh, it's what's on the slide there. And um, within the circular as well, it states what the funds for, from uh, that circular can be spent on, such as um, software applications or Wi-Fi um, infrastructure within the school. So that, I suppose, is the funding for the next year. Um, as regards the vision for the integration of digital technologies, this is a statement from the digital strategy 2015 to 2020, just that the department wants to realize the potential of digital technologies to enhance the teaching, learning, and assessment so the relevance of young people become engaged thinkers, active learners, knowledge constructors, and global citizens to participate fully in society and the economy. And part of that strategy, um, on, I think it's page 14 of it, um, states that in future years, curriculum will have aspects of digital technologies embedded in it and how um, new developments in curriculum will have to engage with how pupils develop their digital skills as well. One of the objectives from the digital strategy was that um, PDFT and the department were to adapt the NSYC competency framework for teachers for the Irish context. And in this regard, just to take a little look at that framework, you can see some outline of it there, how it's arranged in three successive um, stages for teachers' development, and that each stage of development addresses those areas. So that was um, one of the, under, the documents that underpin the digital learning framework. The others, I suppose, uh, would, on, from an international basis, you have the UNESCO ICT competency framework, and also the European, European Commission uh, Teach Conference in the EU program. <coughs> um, obviously, you also have the digital strategy for school 2015 2020 that went into making um, and formulating the digital learning framework. All of that is aligned then with the Looking at Our Schools document from 2016, the practice document. So the framework was released in October 2017, and there's been a pilot on the way this year. There's 50 schools involved, 30 primary and 20 post-primary. The pilot is also being evaluated by the Education Research Centre. We've been facilitating and, and supporting the schools that are involved in it over the year. And just to bring you down into the framework then, you've got two dimensions within it, and four domains within each dimension. This is aligned directly to the Looking at Our Schools document from 2016 as well. So you can see there under Teaching and Learning, four different domains and leadership and management, four domains as well. Within
within each um, dimension, you have standards. So overall, 32 in all. And they are the same standards, again, as we're looking at a few documents. Um, the arts and being made of schools and principals would be more familiar with those standards. Moving on from that, you've got your statement of effective and highly effective practice, again mirroring uh, the looking at a school document. Those statements are to help schools to assess where they're at and where they need to be next, how to move from, how to move perhaps to effective practice and then on to highly effective practice. So as regards to the new the digital learning framework, the, the vision for it is that it can be used at a whole school level, the subject area or department level at post primary, and um, for a particular year group or program level, also cross curricular among different subject levels um, at, at post primary and primary, and for the individual teacher as well to find out where they are at and where they need to move towards. The digital learning planning guidelines were written to accompany the framework to help support schools in writing and coming up with a digital learning plan and help them go through the six-step process in, in, in framing their digital learning plan. They're available on the PUC Technology and Education site. Uh, Sinead is going to talk more about that a little later on as well. So I'll just let Sinead take over from here. Um, thank you, Mark. Um, so, how did the schools get started developing their digital learning plan? Um, some schools might have done something before along the learning plans and that, so sometimes it's possible to adapt to that. So, the two fundamental things every school needs to do to get started is to think about the vision. What do you want digital learning to look like in your school? Because if you don't know where you want to go, you can never get there. So, you have to, so we really need to sit down and think about that. And this takes a little bit more time. Um, because we've been supporting the pilot schools, uh, there's about 50 of them involved in the trial at the moment, and it's taken a bit of time for our schools to develop the vision and what they want digital learning to look like in their school and what they want it to feel like. Uh, the other important thing to do is to establish a digital learning team. Okay, you cannot do it by yourself. Any school who tries, whether it's just one person on the team, or you know, there's always one or two people who are kind of more digital savvy and might be pushing it, but it's not enough. It has to be a team effort and you can support the leadership as well. So when we're looking at creating a digital learning plan, we're following the six steps of the school evaluation, that school type evaluation that most schools would be reasonably familiar with now. So we're going to just talk through each step now. Step one, identifying a focus. So you have to develop um, a focus for your learning review, but there's huge scope for digital learning in schools. The infrastructure, the teaching and learning element of it, the leadership and management of it. So, you know, what, what do you want to focus in for your school? Because you can't do everything at once. You have to do a kind of an initiative process. So, in order to do this, the team needs to become familiar with the standards and the statements of practice. Um, and then the idea is to focus on one standard from each dimension, so one from teaching and learning and one from leadership and management. And you'll find when you start working with it there's, that there's a lot of crossover, that something that you're doing in leadership and management will actually lend itself to teaching and learning as well. Um, and then choose who will be involved. So do you want to get the whole school involved? Is it just going to be um, a, a subject subject group that you're looking at or a small number of teachers to start off with and then as, as the year goes on you'll expand it. So the school actually then needs to write a vision for the digital learning and this is kind of step one. Step two, gathering evidence. Okay, So you have to find out where your school is at. You might think you know where your school is at but you really need the evidence to make sure. So. Um, you have to think about how are you going to gather the evidence, and this is based on the statements that you picked. So whatever statements you pick, you look at them, you unpack them, and you go, right, what questions do I need to have answered in order to know whether we're achieving these statements or not? Um, 
Um, so what kind of methods could we use? You could use a SCOT analysis, which is strength challenges, opportunities, and threats. Um, focus group with teachers, focus group with students, review student work, reflection sheets with teachers and students, or you can survey. And I, I've seen in one or two schools where the schools are actually a little bit, the, the savvy move, I suppose, is that when they were doing some of their research for school self-evaluation, they included some digital technology questions as well. You know, you can link the two plans. They are two separate plans, but they, they support each other. So, you know, whatever you're focusing on for literacy, there can be a digital technology element on that that will link over to a digital learning plan and it can support each other instead of having to run two separate kind of initiatives. So after you've gathered your analysis, sorry, after you've gathered your evidence, then you have to analyze and make judgment. Okay. And so if you look at, you know, you reflect on what's coming, what's coming back from your survey and what does that tell you about where your school is at on its digital learning journey. The, the, it's kind of a three-year plan, but you review it at the end of every year. So you might need to do, as, as you step through it, you know, because step two is gathering the evidence, as, the, as you step through the steps to the end, you'll be reflecting on have you achieved the targets and the actions that you put in place. And then based on that, you'll be putting new targets and actions for the following year, but it might be a smaller piece of evidence that you're gathering because you're, you're on a path at that stage and you might decide, right, well, we've achieved this target and this target, but not really this one, so this is one that needs to roll on over into the following year. So it's kind of like a living, breathing document, if that makes any sense. Um, so based on the, the um, evidence that you gather, you identify actions that will take place. So, Step four, you're going to write and share the digital learning plan. So you decide on certain targets that you want. You know, you, you might realize that only 20% of teachers are using digital technologies with the students um, on a weekly basis, and you might want to increase that to 40%. So what actions do you need to take in order to have that happen? So your target might be to increase it. What action do you need to take in order to do that? Um, so a process is developed, you have to put a time, time frames have to be put in and um, there's people are, the plan, sorry, people have to be assigned certain tasks and to kind of check that it's being done. So this is what the digital plan roughly looks like. It's kind of hard to see it there on the screen. There's two parts to it. The first part doesn't really change from, from it won't really change at the end of your first year because the first part is just your vision and where your school is currently at on its digital learning journey. So what are you doing well in the school at the moment? What, what's working? Okay, part two then is your targets and your actions. So in part two, you say, right, we've identified this standard and this statement. This is what we're going to focus on. And the actions that we're going to take in order to achieve our targets. This is, these are the people that are going to be involved. These are the resources we need. And this is the time frame that it's going to take people. Okay, so then you put the plan into action. Okay. Um, so it's implemented. The idea is when the plan is written, I forgot to say that it should be introduced to the whole school and the whole school should be aware that this plan is, is, is um, taking place and it needs to be signed off as well by the board of management. Um, so the plan is being implemented. Your digital learning team is, is monitoring it and just making sure that it's moving along, they're having their, their, their meetings, even if it's just once a term, to see, to make sure that the plan is kind of in action, you know, be arranged for continued session development for teachers or a project or something like that, but it's all happening. And the entire staff, and again, this is the difference between primary and post-primary, because in a primary school, you might have the entire staff involved in the digital learning plan, and post-primary, it might just be a certain number of subject departments that you're going to start with, and then you expand out to the whole school eventually. So, um, but the whole school should be aware of the digital learning plan. And then step six, so you've, you've done your plan, you've implemented it, and at the end of the year, you have to carry out a review. Okay. 
obviously has been successful or not. You know, there's no point in setting actions and targets if you never go back and actually check, well, were they actually achieved? And then the whole process begins again, because hopefully some of your targets have been achieved. Some of them might be targets that will take the full three years. You know, talk to students who are bringing in a, a virtual learning environment. So they want to introduce it to the teachers first, and they want to get the teachers collaborating. But that takes a bit of time, and it, it builds up over the three years. So they might have certain targets that will ultimately lead to, at the end of the three years, the teachers collaborating in a digital space. So the support, support materials, um, Roy mentioned some of them um, already. They're all available on the PDST TIE website. Um, the, there's a primary and a post-primary section. The digital learning framework is up there. Now, just to be clear, the digital learning framework is on a trial basis at the moment. So the version that's up there is not the ultimate final version. So before you go printing off 20 copies for all of your teachers, um, wait uh, a few months because at the moment, the 50 schools that are involved in the trial they are going to feed back to the ERC, who are then going to compile a report for the department on how they found trialing this digital learning framework in their school. And based on that, there may be some adjustments made to the digital learning framework. So it's not the final, final version, but it's up there, the one that we have at the moment for the, the trial. And um, the digital learning planning guidelines, as Roy mentioned earlier, that basically expands on all the six steps that I just taking you on a whistle stop tour um, now, and it has in there the uh, plan template as well, and there's good practice videos. I'm just going to show you those, um, I'll show you what they look like in a second. So the planning guideline is available to download, and the good practice videos, we've always had good practice videos up on the, the PDST website, but what the, um, the tech med people have done is they have mapped the videos to the standards. So when you go in there now, if you decide to pick a certain standard under teaching and learning, you, know, you might do it from learner outcomes or from teacher collaborative practice. And any good practice videos that we have have been mapped to those specific standards. So they're examples of what it might actually look like in practice. And there are currently more videos being developed um, to support this. And as soon as they're done, they will be up on the website as well. So it's worth your while keeping, keeping an eye on this website because materials and support for the Okay. so that's it. Um, if there's any questions, we might have a minute to Harder than you think to do. Um, so it's no harm. It's 
start to speak about now and even start to inform a bit of the teacher learning season, just to even asking yourself, well, what do we want the teacher learning to look like in our school? You know, what do we need to, to do in order to, to do that? You know, you might want students to um, engage more creatively with digital technology, but if they don't have devices and if the Wi-Fi doesn't work in the school, then that's an issue. So you might have to do something from a teacher from the leadership management section in order to get some of that logistical stuff working to support the teaching and learning element as well. Yeah. Yeah, just, um, just two points. Uh, first point is that um, some of the, the, the ETDs are coordinating this process across schools. So for example, in the DDL ETD, they've brought all the schools together and they've told them how to create an e plan and so on, so that it's kind of coordinated. So if anybody's in, a D, in an ETD school, there might be that plan at kind of a central level. Second thing is, you mentioned this has to be implemented from September for everyone. Is that, is that the case? It's going to start to roll out from September. Right. Um, and the hope is, and we, we haven't got a final word on this yet, but the hope is that there'll be a national rollout of seminars and post for students for next year as well. Too much 
much time or effort. And we then looked at a whole school approach. So undoubtedly in schools, no different to our own, there are pockets of great and effective, shall we say, effective integration of technology taking place. And in other classes, not necessarily, simply because teachers may not have had the interest or equally the expertise, or there might have been that fear factor element. But through this whole process, we looked at juniors and seniors, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, and looked at different technology that could be integrated to help develop literacy, numeracy skills. And it certainly has, excuse me, has brought teaching and learning in a cross curricular level to life. And I think, while I personally have a huge interest in the area, and it was happening in my classroom, I think it's fantastic now from a whole school perspective that that's what's happening. And through the framework, I think that's what you're, you're getting at. It's not just the one or two classes in a school, it's more on a whole school level. So it is possible without a huge amount of um, extra effort, I would find. Can I just try out for one clarification? Because I just went and looked at the circle. And I, 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 if I was a school, I would be very concerned if, to hear that future funding is dependent on having a digital learning plan. My interpretation of the, of the circular, I uh, work for the PBSC, the Commons of Education uh, Infrastructure, no, uh, whatever. So it says, it, it, that, that is not the case. It says, part of the funding, it says funding for future years, uh, part of the funding will be issued to schools on application. Uh, like there's some programs going on, going like the cluster project, so part of the funding is, 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 is currently being issued on an application. So all schools this year get the grants, my view is next year, my interpretation of the even discussions I've had with the department, I may be wrong, but I think all schools will get grants next year and be erupted, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But there will be some funding uh, that will be part of the funding will be issued to schools on application, subject to certain conditions being met. They will, this will, these will include evidence of a digital learning plan. Now, off the record, I, I had a conversation with the department saying, why don't you get 4,000 digital learning plans? What are you going to do with them? And the department said, oh, we, we don't have the resources to look at them. So, so if you don't have the resources to look at them, I mean, why would you ask for them? So evidence of a digital learning plan might be a tick box. And you know, I'm only saying this to relay certain fears that people might have. Hopefully, people are not tweeting the time. <laughs> the situation might be going on. But I just want to say, look, I don't, if it, if boxes of the learning plans are out of the department, the department would not know what to do with them. Right? Yeah, that's the reality. Okay, thanks, sorry. So, uh, if does anyone have, we've one, maybe one or two quick further questions and then we'll break up for lunch. Yes, for a break. Yes, so we were, my apologies, yeah, for, for a break. And we are running behind time, but we were just given notification that if we roll on to, until um, 10 past, Another minute or two, if that was okay. So um, we had a question up here. Yes, sorry. Please. Yes. Mark, sorry, across the I just want to make a comment. Uh, we're again involved with Stephen here with yourself. And um, just again, to be sure, people, that it is doable, that there are many teachers on our staff, just like you're saying, that are very interested in this area. And like Tom said as well, it is about keep, keeping it simple. And the digital plan, every board who's spending money actually needs and has accountability. Of what 
Bible, from most of my school, right to the Shannon, or small old school. Uh, and usually my digital learning teams are two people in the front page, which is the whole school. Uh, so, yeah, and, and, and I totally understand where you're coming from, because every time I say digital learning team, I see the front page of the eye. But I, I get where you're coming from as regards workload. Yes, the workload is, is also, in some ways, more in a small school, but in some ways less, because sometimes it's easier to make change in a smaller school than it is in a big school. As regards templates and things like that, the templates are blank, and they're blank for a reason. They're blank because every single school I go into is completely different. Yeah. You know? um, so there's nothing there at the minute to.
I, I, I look quite young for a lot of people, but I, I've been around a lot trying to stop them. How many mistakes I've made? These schemes. I'm going to actually talk about the detail later on. The biggest mistake I've ever did. There's no point me going, oh, this is amazing, this is what I get up to, but, you know, I'm as nervous as you guys are. Actually, I'm probably more nervous than every single teacher put together. Teachers, though, are starting, which is amazing, to go, I want to learn this. Every single camp and training session I've done is in teachers' own time. And it's all show. The numbers are phenomenal. There is an amazing hunger right now to learn how to teach computer science or computing or computational thinking, any one of these words in the space, without thinking of specific technology. Um, teachers also come around regularly. This is a group of further education teachers who get up an entire day on a Saturday to come and learn code. There's, I've done this workshop with lots of other teachers and students. It's incredible the hunger and appetite that people have right now to learn computer science. And it makes me happier and happier and more energetic to do this because everybody wants to learn a little bit. And it doesn't have to learn from me, it can be from absolutely anything. And I'm really lucky in my current job that my, my boss, and I'll talk to him a little bit later, is pretty much giving me free reign. So if you want to teach it, go teach it. If you want to laugh, go get a laugh. And then I can hold any crazy ideas, you can find Which is incredible. So there's, there's, there's quite clear there's all the way from finding school to further that level. Um, this is working with microbit workshops, and most teachers are smiling. That's a Saturday at 4 o'clock in the They stay an hour longer than they should have to learn how to do some interesting things with them. And to be honest, all of these, you can really flip around for saying teaching computational thinking, teaching problem solving, teaching a little bit of code, or again. Yeah. The, the items I use are almost irrelevant. It's the concepts, and they transpire across everything. And also, I don't know how lucky I can say to be part of the I say to be part, I kind of hijack it, and I go along. And this is one of Richard's sessions in Kildare. I, I want to go through as many of these as I can because, well, these sessions I like to meet people and share ideas. Right? And I am as much about listening, and I try to be anyway, as I am about showing, because when I listen, I learn a lot more. Um, and it's really, really important. I mean, this is such an amazing community that everybody wants to get around and see this. Um, I like to give talks on technology enhanced learning. For the entire talk, I put my puppy on the screen to show that sometimes you don't need a screen and technology to teach the concepts you want. And for the entire hour talk, again, on our technology and enhanced learning and passion, to our education teachers, my little puppy stayed in the street. And I wanted to prove a point that I really like my puppy, and it's actually my dog. And I really like my puppy, but, and I, you know, some people put stuff up on the screen sometimes because they like it, but it's not that relevant. And I get to go and try all these sort of crazy things, and sometimes they work, and sometimes they don't. And I also never imagined this in a million years. I am so lucky to be sponsored by Microsoft and the stuff that we do. So Microsoft sponsored me to go around school as, long, as well as Tal IT to teach this stuff. If you asked me at 16 years of age when I was trying to learn C++ on my own, which failed miserably by the way, um, I would never thought in a million years I'd be lucky enough to get backing from some complete like this, to be able to talk. I still can't believe I'm standing in front of all of you actually, talking about computer science. I mean, this is incredible. And this is the numbers we've hit this year so far. And each, that number, 1,843, is the number of students and teachers I've spent at least an hour with doing microbit computational thinking, scratch. It is phenomenal. I cannot believe I'm having this sort of effect. or able to get to people and they want to listen. And out of that, there's 301 teachers, 1,542 students, and we hope to get another 1,200 for May finish. That's nearly 3,000 people I might be able to get there, all because of, of my boss, my people, and my people. It is incredible to allow me to do this. I could be part of it. Also, the education centres have now said, would you come and teach my kids or whatever in the education centres? And this is, I cannot believe my journey. I am so, so lucky to be able to do this. And um, in 2010, I snuck onto the last forum for the Junior Cycle Show. And I mean snuck, I shouldn't really have been there. Uh, I got invited up because I was a member of an ETV and I snuck up. And that day was changed my life for good. Because on that day, I made some recommendations for the course and they actually listened to me, and they made it into the final paper for the Junior Cycle Short Course. This started me going, well, if I can do this, maybe, maybe we can try something else. Following that this year, uh, Stephen Howell from Microsoft and Crumlin Newton, which we developed the first level four programming module, and it's now going to QQI, which means students who are in Newton, which are level four, have a chance now to get excited in programming to move up into PLC for college. I cannot believe that we're sort of making some changes in our and finally, this is my luckiest thing I've ever got. I, I, I can't tell you how lucky I am, but I've got a lot of notes for the NCCA, for the microbit and Python. And I'm doing this because of what I learned in 
those 1,800 feet. What went right, what went horribly wrong. And I can't believe I can put that up on the screen and go, I do a little bit of work for, for the people that make the leading stuff still in this. It's unbelievable. And finally, I'm also a student in for my course. And my research is in learning to program, what makes people fail, and how you intervene to have the time. And this ties in so well. And I get to travel around and, and write some papers and do some research. So I feel so lucky. In one day, I'm working with six-year-old kids and I'm trying to write a paper for something later on for a minute. Um, I'm nearly finished now. And I, I, I want to do more. I really do. At this point, I'm going to stop. And this is my big goal. This is the kind of part of this, this particular presentation that I take the time to just cover. As to why I wanted to talk to teachers today. Because there's this word called self -help. Um it's a word that's easier for me than yourself at doing one particular task. In, in this case, it's teaching public. And for my research, I was able to show quite, quite well that students learning computer science don't believe in English, especially female students, and we've loads of papers going after them. But students don't believe in themselves. And that means that, that is actually a flag or a correlates to failing or pa not passing. But it turns out that anecdotally, yeah, as in just in this year alone, I feel teachers have the exact same. And by doing that, I want to tell my actual story. Not the Facebook one, where I get to show you where I go and who employs me and who sponsors, but the actual story I think. So if you don't mind, I'm going to start with this really embarrassing story of that's me. And you probably guess it from me. I bleached my hair because I really like m and And this was in 2000 when I did this, right? And I was a student, and I was a really, really happy. I can't even tell you how average a student I was. I love bike man, I'm bike man with a very head. But I was a really average student. And this is the school I went to. And in that school, I was extremely average. My, my leaving cert was average. You know when you say that, nobody believes you? Well, guess what? Sorry? There's my leaving cert. And even worse, it's in my pocket. That's my actual leaving cert results I got in 2003. And there's a reason I showed this. Because after this, I thought I'd never amount too much. And I mean this. Because when I was doing maths, and there's my amazing maths teacher. And I'm sorry for any face I put up here, by the way. I don't mean to embarrass you, but that's my maths teacher. And when I was doing maths, and I don't know if you ever felt the same, I thought he was a god. Right? I did not, I was so nervous about being so higher level maths. It's the only good grade I had. And out of all those grades, I thought the maths teacher was a genius. And I, I don't know if you sit like this, but when I was sitting in a classroom, I honestly was thinking in my head, I would give anything to know what's inside that teacher's head. To be able to be that good at maths. And I sat there all the time, and I got through the leading cert, but I wouldn't have got through it without that teacher, because he was either the devil or the best teacher in the world, because during the Easter break, he gave us eight hours of maths a day. And we had to do it. Not because he would give you attention or not, he was just that type of person that you had to work for, or else you left. And I got these results, and at that point in time, I went, I'm not that smart, I know I'm not. But I worked really hard, and I got a no favor in the of maths, which was, to me, not possible. And that teacher taught me the most important lesson. That's why I carry around my leading set results in my wallet. If I ever go and meet you again, ask me for it, I promise you it's in my wallet, to remind me that if you work hard, you can do anything. It doesn't mean it's easy, it doesn't mean you think you can. Next then, I went on to college, and the exact same thing happened to me. I got a first year of computer science, and in that year, the lecturers were funded. They were they were just geniuses. And so much so that, again, I thought the same thing. Never in a million years will I ever be able to do anything on the scale that these guys can do. I am just not in their league. I am not intelligent enough. And there's my two lectures I had in first year at. Uh, Susan Morgan and Aidan Mooney. And they were, they were my lab demonstrators. And actually, I want to give you a little bit of research I'm doing right now. That's my supervisor, Susan, and, and Aidan as well. That's my supervisor, Susan. I was in her pilot study when I was in first year. I didn't even know. I just fill in these papers I wrote on the go, right? And that year, I thought I will never, ever be good enough to be a lecturer. Never even thought I'd be a teacher. So I kept going to college like every other student does. And I finished and didn't know what to do. And I knew I liked coding at the end of my degree in computer science. And I went to court and went to, to go to, to be a teacher at a higher diploma. And what happened then was they had not computer science. Actually, they had a computing module, and I went in there thinking I could teach code or something. And that didn't work out. So straight away, I am now a teacher with a bit of physics in my degree. who wasn't really good at anything, just kind of science. So I went out to be a teacher, and I ended up teaching in this school. And the worst and best thing in the world happened to me in that year in that school. The 
first year in school, they said, yeah, you have to ask me to walk in the door. I went, okay, I got to college. I mean, then they said, you're going to teach higher elements. And my face dropped. And for the first class, I remember this because I lost a lot of sleep. The first day, I spent the entire weekend, about 12 hours a day, preparing for one 40 minute class in higher level maths. I had every option covered. And I was so nervous because I never thought I could be a higher level maths teacher. Then I went in, all that work paid off, and the class went back. The students didn't mind the 24 hours worth of work in for 40 minutes, but they thought I was a maths. And in my head at that point, I thought, well, that made me want my other teacher, because he all came to class with sheets, but could he work out maths? So in my head, I thought, okay, so now I'm starting to build a bit of confidence. Same two years later, I then I applied and started teaching further education in computer science there. But before that, I made a mistake. And this is my first and biggest mess up in my life. This will haunt me until the day I stopped teaching. I left MOOC as a Java program. And I thought leaving there, programming is Java. And when I was doing this, I learned this lesson the hardest way. I started the coding thing. And, I, and I, I convinced the teacher in my first year to let me teach computer science in secondary school. Please, please let me do it. It was a desk school, so they had hours to teach computer science. And I said, let me have a go. And what's the only thing I knew? Job. So I was nervous, and guess what I tried to teach? Job. To a desk school, second year students. And guess what? It failed miserably. And that's not, that's, not, that's not a problem. That's actually not my bad story. You know what my bad story is, and my most embarrassing thing in life? Is at that point, the student came to me and said, there's this really cool language out there called Scratch. And that year, Scratch came apart. And you know what I did? I said, looked at it for two seconds. I didn't give it any conversation. I said, that's what it is. And that day, that student went, all right, I learned how to say so. And as it progressed, Java failed miserably, didn't work at all. And I started looking at Scratch more often. And I went, actually, this is a really cool language. I could have thought of all the first year. And there's a student, two years later. He won the ICS Scratch Awards two years in a row. And I held him back for half a year because I tried to teach him Java and not Scratch. There's his source code. That's one of 27 slides to the right of what that student built on his own. And you know when you go to competitions, people say teachers help them code? I gave him a classroom and a whiteboard. We storyboarded it. We gave him all the rules. He worked the entire summer, eight hours a day on that case, in my classroom. I just came in once every day to make sure he was still alive. He actually stopped shaving for the entire summer to build this game. The student grew a beard in the picture. <laughs> it's incredible. And from that day, I learned that well, the way I go may not be right, and don't be afraid to make mistakes. So then I went back and I said, okay, after this, I'm now learning to be a teacher, so I want to do more. So I went back to do research, or a PhD, actually a master's I started with. And I walked into the office of Susan Lee, and I've never felt more intimidated in my life. You know that word I mentioned in South Africa the other day? I didn't know what that meant. What's worse is, I gave a presentation to Elizabeth Oldham in 2010 under one with the the forum for computing, which is all the heads of computer science, and I couldn't defend the words of that. Asked my wife for the whole day beforehand, I was going to South Africa, South Africa, because I couldn't do it. And these are all the challenges we have. Just keep progressing it, and we'll get there. So now I've started this, and I'm nearly finished. And on that same forum, I met my boss, uh, Dr. Barry Feeney, the head of computing IT talent. And that, that day after that, we've had, re we had relationships and calls since. And now I'm a lecturer there, and he understands the need for computer science to get around. And that's, that's the story that it's not easy. And when I say I'm here to inspire teachers, I really am. People see me, and I go out and I talk about holding or deliver a workshop, and people are like, you're so, you know, you've, you've done this before. I've done this in 2010, I've failed more often than you think. The trick is to keep going and help people with stories. So my idea is that why I'm here is to go, it's you guys that are making the future. Don't be afraid that the student might be smart. Don't be afraid that you're making a mistake. You have to learn. If you don't make a mistake, you don't learn. And I really wanted to show this because I believe that everybody sees just the front Facebook side of what I do. They see that I get serious numbers and I go do CPD and I'm, I'm really lucky. But I wasn't always lucky. And it's been 10 years in there at this stage of trying to get in the right place at the right time and failing sometimes. And don't be afraid. And that's kind of the talk I wanted to give to them. I want to say if you're here in this room, spread this word. This is more important than anything else. Is that in two years' time, when all the CPD stops and everybody gets the computer science for leaving cert, I will be no more. I will just be a lecturer in the past. But until then, I was lucky enough to be a teacher. I was lucky enough to fail as a teacher. And everybody should be looking to do the same thing, but don't be worried about it. And that's pretty much my talk.
Python, you might be a bit nervous, right? And the point is that we all were. The first day I walked into my research, I was terrified. The first day I walked into that last class, I was terrified. Do you know I like 30 minutes every time last class? Oh my God, so I'm so excited about this. So it's perfectly fine to be nervous, but you also have to balance it with eventually I will get there. I promise you, it's not take a couple of years, but you will get there. You think you speak very personally. Thank you. About your own feelings and your own experiences. And like, it's very engaging. I enjoy it enormously. Thank you. When are you going to be more disrespectful? Never. <laughs> 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 um, I think that's your next road path. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. because disrespectful sounds awful, it sounds very negative. But I actually mean critical, critical um, in a way that is helpful to other people. Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. So, it's a constructive question. Critical friendship. Make sure that you're tapping all of those aspects. They're still learning what a loop is at the end of the day. 
everything else is just if they are exploring or replicating, whatever suits their needs has to be done. But I think that's really important. That's it's a new, it's a very new space out. So I want to stop it there. So I don't tell you to go if you want to go. There's also another session in here. I don't know who the chair is for that session. Um, it's Stephen Gallagher and Michelle Brady. Is that still on? That's you two. Yeah. yeah. Come yeah. down to the front then. Uh, yeah. And I'll, I'll hang on and see if anybody comes to the chair because they don't want to stay. But so, if you want to go to another session, I can see the Catholic panel on in uh, 205 and then uh, the rest are all uh, on our own workshops. So Thank you again, Pete. Thank you for being here. I'm looking forward to my uh, deep meeting my cousin.
Um, which has to understand, and this is a really simple approach, which if you're in any sort of uh, leadership role, or as a teacher in the school, if you want to take on a role you can do, and you can bring this concept into your staff. It's really easy, and what is about, you know, professional development for our staff. All right, Michelle, you want to take it? So, Start we have a chance to complete that survey. Um, the reason we just want you to, uh, to look at some results where a tiny dot cc um, forward slash to the As I said, that's my uh, husband who talked for his father. And we saw my URL, he talked, he said, you know what, you can tell very clearly we don't work with computer science. Because no one would ever make the URL at that end. So that's clearly shows my primary school teacher. The reason we want to actually start off with getting that feedback from yourselves, the people in this room, is that we can actually gauge from looking at yourselves what sort of a percentage of teachers in this room at the moment are currently using technology in terms of the day-to-day -day running of your schools in the form of those um, student information systems and virtual learning environments in your schools? So of the number of participants here who completed that survey, it's very interesting to see at the moment we're looking at 70 percent of you said that in your schools you're using this. So if I ask you to complete that survey maybe uh, five years ago, I'd imagine that people would but similarly, if you were to look at that survey in two or three years' time, I'd be getting hundreds of times, and getting close to start, especially with the digital learning framework, looking at the amount of skills investments. Looking at our results there to see, it's great to see that we are looking at the people in the room, remember, we're all here assessing, so we always have a clear interest in using the technology, and you're raising your confidence levels of using this technology to do the same thing in terms of the four and five, which is brilliant to see. When we look with them, look at us, are there individuals in your schools? So this is interesting to see that you can see a little, uh, a percentage there, but it's about 27% who said no, that in the schools there's not actually people in your schools who have the confidence out of using these features. And finally, the most important one that we are looking at, and this is what this, um, this is all about, is looking at that figure that is that 75% of people said that there are teachers in your school who have to say that they would love to learn how to use so this is really where this idea of the split staffing has come from. So well, the reason why we've looked at this really is because of the fact that in the last, last recent years, as a survey has shown that schools are using technology more and more in the day to day world of their schools. So they're using student information systems and they're using virtual learning environments uh, for those day to day tasks in their schools. So when we look at that idea of student information systems, um, a common one that's been used in a lot of primary schools is the likes of the land, there's loads of other products out there. Post primary, we're looking at the likes of CDX, where it's been used a lot. So these information systems are being used to manage the information about the pupils in your school. So we're looking at the attendance in the course that we now, uh, recording the standardized results, general information about the pupils who are in your school. So from a management point of view, the implementation of the digital technology at this level is making the role of management so much easier for them to manage the information about the students in their schools and um, much more efficiently that is in the paper format. So there's major benefits to it. So we're looking towards that whole idea of the virtual learning environment. So this has stemmed from as more and more students and pupils in our schools are engaging with technology more and more on a daily basis. So they themselves are actually now creating content. So Steve and I have said we are both from the SU advisors, so we are traveling in the country all the time. We're working in schools and we're seeing more and more teachers and embedding technology into their daily practice. So we want the students to take that technology into our hands and they are creating their own content. If these students are creating the content, they need someone to store it. So as a result of this, from a needs point of view, schools are recognizing that they need to provide a storage space for the students and the teachers so they have somewhere to store this content. So when you think of the digital learning framework, schools are going west in Lyca, and they've created all these wonderful two classics and their e-books, so where do they put them? The left is the right and the truck. So you have to think of the means. Where is it being saved and how is it being used? So when do we want that source vision? Now we have that connection. When you go to an online platform, when you use the work learning environment, the pupils now can use, they can access that content in school, so they can also access it. They are now owners of their digital content, and this digital content can now be used to form an e-portfolio, which is coming really, really important at the primary level, especially, but it's becoming more and more uh, important at primary level, too. So, that, I suppose, from the needs point of view, the schools are recommending the need for them to invest in a virtual learning environment. So, examples of a virtual learning environment, Google, they have the G 
education, education which is free for, um, for schools to get. You get unlimited storage with it. So you have all of your creative features on the computer, Google Docs, you've got your slides, sites, and all the rest of it as well, okay? When you move on the Microsoft thing, the Office 365 version, which a lot of schools are using as well, that's Microsoft for Education. And schools are using one-to-one -one devices, like iPads, one-to-one -one devices, they might be the easy likes of iTunes. So the engagement of technology at this level is brilliant. For all of us in this room, we've raised our confidence levels of four out of five in all how to use. But we need to take a step back. We need to think about the teachers in our staff who aren't so confident. They are now, how are they feeling about this? They are now expected to call, call the role on the student information. They now have to upload their previous leases onto a drive because they can't have the time on a cloud list. How in the world do I put it into the cloud? What the cloud? So this is what we need to start thinking about. What can we do with those teachers who are now being daunted, intimidated, and sometimes overwhelmed by this whole idea? So this is where your flipped staff and approach comes into play. So when you think about the flipped classroom for what is flipped learning, flipped learning happens when your direct instruction that moves away from the group today is the individual learning style. Okay? We're all teachers here. That is your own concept. So I'm a primary school teacher. Imagine I'm teaching a new maths concept. So I know in my classroom I have a range of ability levels in my class. So initially, I teach my maths concept to the whole class level. Then what I do is I create my own instructional video using the lights to explain everything or any fight for words and sort of uh, applications. I create an instructional video for my pupils explaining that maths concept. This might be how to find a fractional set. Now, that is assigned as homework for the pupils. So when the students themselves are at home, they now watch that instructional video at home, in their own house, at their own time, and their own pace, to develop their understanding of that content. So if you think about the children sitting in front of you, they just don't want to be there today. They don't want to hear it. But they still want to learn how to learn math. So it might suit them much better. 10 o'clock in the morning is not their math time. 3 o'clock in the afternoon is. So by engaging with this flip classroom of flip learning, we are enabling our students to learn at their own time and at their own pace. So that student who actually needs to watch that video five times, they can't play the content. Now your group space is transformed. So as a teacher now, you can spend more time facilitating project-based activities to problem solve. So now the students themselves, they are now becoming much more interactive with the problem solving concept. They're getting an opportunity to apply their understanding of these concepts and they become much more creative in how they go about solving these problems. We know it's not only always just one solution. And finally, they become much more engaged with the whole problem, with the whole space. So, what does this mean from a teacher's point of view? Okay, so what we're going to do is we take that same understanding of differentiation. In our schools, we have teachers with a range of different abilities in terms of use of technology. So we're going to take that same concept that we have of differentiation in our classroom teaching, apply that flipped to a staffing approach. So we do this in the form of instructional videos to create in-house CPD resources or library of resources or videos, which the teachers in the school can then watch at their own pace. So we've all used Google or YouTube a million times to look for how to videos. If you like me, sometimes they're 20 minutes long. When I see 20 minutes, we're only open. So what we are focusing on getting short, concise, to the point, and they are personal. So the videos that we are looking at here, they are created by staff in your school for staff in your school. So they become really personal to your school. So if you think that it's that time of year again and it's um, your standardized results come up, if you're confident, you know how to upload those onto your student information system. You remember over here last year in, uh, in, the, in the staff room, somebody was doing a progress report. To get this lovely clear snapshot, colour coded, how the whole class is run, was all up and down and it was lovely, but you've no idea how to do it. So you know Mary next door is brilliant at using her student information system. So you go to Mary and say, Mary, is there any chance that you can come up with videos for me? Teaching me how to run that progress report. So now, instead of that conversation just existing between those two people, that video was now shared with the whole staff. So you might be on a staff of 60 people. So the next person who never even knew it was possible to run the progress report now gets that video. So in addition to the sort of how-to videos, it's a fantastic tool to use in terms of an induction pack or a welcome pack. 
immune teachers who are joining your school. So we all know schools are very, very busy places. So this is a perfect space to start putting those messages, to welcome those teachers, to sit at that time, to promote that well-being within your staff, so that we are there for you when you join our school. In addition to those how-to videos, it's an excellent space to use for good practice videos. So I'm sure if you're aware of the PDST Technology and Education website, we have our good practice videos there. This is a space where, as a school yourself, teachers and your staff can create the pet logo, videos where they can actually showcase digital tools that they use themselves in the classroom with the resources available to you in your school. And it makes it so much more manageable and potentially attainable to say, you know what, if down next door can do that, with our laptops, I'm sure I could give the dose up. Because you've got practice. Then you also have space for school procedures. So more and more, as we are using the and um, as more and more as the technology becomes part of the day to day practice, you might have a policy in your school if you have behaviour issues with students. You are now expected potentially to record that information on your student system. You don't know how to do it. So that would be something. But I just want to put a little word of warning out there. If you are creating these instructional videos, which Stephen is going to demonstrate you now how to do it, you have to be very mindful of the, your data protection in terms of what information. If you're in creating an instructional video, you want to make sure there's no personal or sensitive information about the teacher or people or parent or anybody is on these videos. So maybe if you were to use a dummy, a dummy class or if you were to use a blur eye tool, Stephen will correct us later um, for this. So I'm going to hand you over now to my colleague Stephen and he is going to talk to you about how you actually go about creating these videos. So, as I said, Stephen Gallagher, I'm <coughs> Um, I'm two years to PDSD. I was a secondary school teacher in Reno College in Dublin. And I was carrying that go to person all the time of how to do stuff in relation to IT because I had an interest in it. So I'm sure that some of you are that person in your school. And for instance, the meters in the school, like, there's lots of things now teachers are expected to do in that online platform. And you know, you might be a, t you might be a student teacher, or you might be a teacher who's going from school to school. And you very much don't play with GC for education. You get a new job or you go for an interview with the principal, how are you on Office 365? There might be a, an issue there for yourself, for your own professional development. So this is just such a simple way of, uh, of helping the teachers with who um, are, in, are in speech on their school. So, the process. The resource is great. I am just going to show, show you four. There's hundreds out there. So like, there's such an abundance of technology out there. And so many people ask me, have you heard of this app? And I'd be like, no. And I'm very open about it. I haven't heard them all, because who has? But the four I like to use, and these are all sort of different platforms, and I just mentioned four, and they're really, really intuitive to use. 20 minutes of playing. And that's the word I always say, playing. Just playing with these applications. And don't go straight in and use the next thing in, in, the, in, the, in, in your classroom. Just play around with it. Get really comfortable with it. So the very first one, which I think is probably my go-to one, is Screencast Automatic. It's such a simple, um, resource and application to use. It's basically a browser-based browser um, technology. So you can use it off your Chrome or your Internet Explorer or your Edge. So you basically go into screencast matic and it's click and start recording. It's simple as that. Um, there is a paid version for that, but the free version is sufficient for any teacher to create these videos. The next one is Loom. So if you're a G Suite for Education school, you might do the new add-on within the Chrome browser or Loom. And this will probably be my go-to one because this is even easier. This is basically you add your extension to your browser and it's a click, record, stop, share. It's as simple as that. So the day when you're in the staff room and someone asks you how to do something and you might have shown them once or twice, you know, a few times before, you go, you know what, I'll just share the video. And it's you talking over, you narrating over. Very, as I said, it's very personal. The conversation is the key part. All these videos are fantastic. I like to create those videos. But it's really in the conversation, you know, have the coffee in the staff room. I watched a video last night and you just, you know, emphasize what that part was. That's why I find it is, um, to be really beneficial to schools. And remember, this is just a resource for schools. An instructional, it's a library. It's like, you know, you've got a shelter book, this is just a part of the school. So the next one we could use, if you're, as Michelle has already highlighted, a lot of schools are platforms. You know, you might have your app in school. 
students who have one-to-one -one iPads. They might be an iTunes user. Most students, I think, are Google, most students, and those are at Microsoft. Who's Microsoft here, by the way? And Google? Right, so that's just what's to show. So if you're a Microsoft student, you might use your Office Mix. Now, I left in the term Office Mix because that's what you might be familiar with. But it's actually been discontinued in May because it's actually so good. So this is a add-on in the PowerPoint, which you can record your screen and do the same things we've talked about. But they're actually discontinuing the add-on and just embedding it in the different applications. So if you're familiar with maybe making a, uh, a Microsoft form, there would be a record tab embedded in that. So in May, you'll see this change happen, and in the PowerPoint and in Stream. So Office 6, perfect for the Microsoft students to get your out. Obviously, this is just uh, an example. You can use whichever ones you want. Whichever ones work for you. I, the most important part is just creating the content. The last one then could be if you're an iPad student. So if you're going down the route of getting an iPad to your school, there's going to be a, a substantial amount of teachers who might be comfortable with using iPads. So how do we sort of upskill them quickly? And you know, you could be that go-to person, but like I said, who is asked and always willing to show someone how to do something. But you can start going, well, actually, do you know what? I use a feature now in the iOS 11, old iPads now, we'll be, we'll be that. So just record it and narrate. And just show me how to do it. So, and straight in, when you record these videos, they're no good unless they're stored somewhere and shared. That's why we want to bring them into a community. OK? So how, share, how do we actually share them? What's the easiest process? And what you can do, I've been working with some students, there's no right or wrong way to do this, but there's a couple of effective ways. And to utilize, I, we, have, we started with the Microsoft one. So there is an application on Microsoft, and everyone who's Microsoft um, student would be, might be familiar with it. But I want to ask this question. Is anyone using Microsoft in your school and has not heard of Stream? Right, so there's a few people here who might have heard of Stream. And Stream is, community to upload these, these videos. And the best thing about it is <coughs> community-wide. So if you input first year, you might have how to set up your email. So every student or every personnel within your school who has the domain, your email address basically, gets to watch them. No one from outside gets. Or you can make it private. So staff like to make their, their clipped staffing or instructional videos community just for staff. Because you know you could be chatting very informally. This is how you do this, this is how you do that and it's a direct conversation goal. So the, the stream where you can build groups and channels. So you can just see an example of it. That is called the, the school's instruction video group. And within that, there's those channels. So that's a channel, that's a channel, that's a channel. And if a teacher comes in and goes, Joe, I'm really good at um, one note. They put in their content in there. Three or four, five, six, whatever. 10 videos of one minute could be, more, could be better than one minute, one video of 10. Because not all eyes are going to be on you know, on the whole video. You just want to go to what you need to know. For VSware, that's perfect. You know, there's so many things in VSware, but you have to sort of get um, familiar with. So find a few videos there to be created. So that's my stuff and um, stream, which I think is like it's fantastic for any of the office schools there. The next one could be, you know, how do we use it with the Google platform? So there's a couple of ways. No right or wrong. We were we were doing it by some teams but this I can say no, oh, there's better ways. You could create your Google site and embed all the videos into your Google site. So everyone within the community would the site, look at all these videos. But another really, uh, really um, powerful one would be to use the classroom and to enroll the teachers within that classroom. So you can see here at the top, it's principal's message. So the principal, could, like, especially for induction. New teacher comes in, first class, and I show them to some of these videos. We don't have time to actually show you how to use this, but you know what? We have five or six videos here that we don't time or we give you the time to actually engage it. Or we recognize the time to do that. And how to take a role and cover a class. Simple, simple stuff. And the topics will be there. The SWR, Google Docs, Google Drive. We, I'm sure most people sitting here know how to do this. But in the staff room, you might have colleagues who don't. And to actually get a someone within a staff room, who might be very comfortable to engage and show them how to create a video, and they create them, that can have a, that can have a knock on effect to, for staff to really engage in this process. And then the Apple Classroom, use an iTunes view. So this will be really for a student who's down the iTunes view, uh, sort of, um, of the one to one Apple tool. Not 
Ukrainian army for the Reds. Would you please? I just want to highlight the great attempts that you're going to facilitate an area for your video and I'm doing it. And this animation should be our habitat. Okay? So the next part is the process. And this is the key. How easy? So I will actually demonstrate now in a minute how easy. I had a conversation with you. We can't just explain the rationale. So the conversation is, well, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to actually, you know, when you went to the classroom and you think you can open your eyes, how would you get the, you know, the screen up and all that? That's the normal conversation I had in my city. Teachers asked me, how would you do this? The air server, something's on this. It's like, I don't know. So now we create the video, show them. So the conversation starts. You pick your topic, as in, this is what the video is going to be. We know the recording to. I'm going to use screen half automatic now. You might use Zoom, off the stage. So give your student cues. And I would say, as a student, have that conversation to, to, to like, go, you know what, we should actually just choose one as a student community that we would, we would use. Because then you can all help each other. And at the last thing is share. It's no good making these videos as long as it, they have to be eyes on them. And it, it be your staff or your student. Eventually, it could be a uh, student community channel for your students. So like we expect them to shoot to come in and show a lot of things how to you know how to use and um, various different applications. They could set bring their to their group. And it's all about getting set up with that channel of community. So you share a bit and then it goes back to conversation. When you when a teacher engages in, in the video, when the teacher engages in creating or watching, back and have a conversation with that with the, the concept creator. You know, like seeing how that works can be an average. We have a conversation. We just sit down and do it. Yeah. So it's getting that conversation, and it's always the same process. Okay. So now I'm going to quickly just demo how easy it is to make a structured video. Has is anyone implementing the flipped learning process within your own teacher and learn? Here, here. And what what resource would you use? Uh, I mean Zoom. Blue. Blue. Is that a problem? 
the two couch actually use the two sides of the table. So like, the table takes an edge. You can be as creative as you want within your own uh, two. So let's just look at screen mathematics. I know I've run out of time. Uh, we'll just see how simple it is. Three, two, one, and this is an example of how to use screencast-o-matic. So I'm going to click on the top screen here. I'm going to go into my preferences, and I don't want a password. No password there is perfect. Okay. So I'm going to stop that, and then on the top screen here. I'm going to go into my preferences, and I don't want a password. No password there is perfect. Okay. So I'm going to stop that. And when it's done, you have option this to turn up to YouTube. You can just save, save it to your, in Loom it's actually much better, because Loom is just saved into that cloud itself. But you have options with screencast and that. It's for yourself to actually choose which one works for you, but they're all so easy. But um, the first starting point, put back to the, just like the flash on my wall is, create that community for your, for your, for your teachers, all community within the, um, the school, all the community. So,